Hello, uh, today I'm going to be talking about intra-abdominal candidiasis and candida peritonitis. So the objectives of this talk are to understand the different forms of intra-abdominal candidiasis, to discuss risk factors that are associated with intra-abdominal candidiasis, and to review the management and outcomes of the disease. So in this slide here you can see the spectrum of invasive uh, candidiasis and the pathogenesis of the disease. We know that um, candida is colonizing the gut and whenever there is a breach in the gastrointestinal tract uh, there is contamination of the intra-abdominal ca uh, cavity with uh, candida and that eventually leads to infection. And the breach in the gastrointestinal tract could be related to a spontaneous perforation or could be related to previous surgery, such as occurs in um, anastomotic leak. Candida may um, then uh, spread into the bloodstream and infect several other organs. And we know a lot about candida bloodstream infections, candidemia, but intra-abdominal candidiasis has not been studied um, as well. So, Intra-abdominal candidiasis is a common form of deep-seated candidiasis, as common as um, bloodstream candida infections in several studies, but it has been poorly studied. Intra-abdominal candidiasis accounts for about 10% of cases of peritonitis, and we know that bacterial co-infection is quite common. Approximately two-thirds of cases of intra-abdominal candidiasis uh, there is co-infection with bacterial pathogens. So here is a classification that we used in our study. Uh, primary peritonitis occurs when there is no apparent breach of the gastrointestinal tract when there is translocation of the organism. Um, primary peritonitis is also seen in the setting of peritoneal dialysis catheter associated peritonitis. In the setting of secondary peritonitis, we have perforation, surgical leak, trauma, or other pathologic process within the abdomen. Tertiary peritonitis we see whenever there is persistent or recurrence of infection uh, despite uh, treatment, either uh, a surgical, surgical control of source control of the infection or uh, antifungal treatment. Intra-abdominal abscess, it's a localized collection of pus and candida, which occurs as a result of a pathological process within the abdomen. And then we have the less common entities of infected pancreatic necrosis and cholecystitis, cholangitis with candida infection. So some of the risk factors for intra-abdominal candidiasis this can be specific, such as recurrent gastrointestinal surgery, perforation of the gastrointestinal tract, or leakage from an anastomosis. And other factors that are not specific to intra-abdominal candidiasis, but can be seen in other forms of invasive candidiasis. And these are prolonged use of uh, broad-spectrum antibiotics, acute renal failure, total, total parental nutrition, stay in the intensive care unit, diabetes mellitus and other forms of immunosuppression. And as in other forms of infection, intra-abdominal candidiasis can be uh, acquired in the community or in the hospital setting. And when you have a hospital-acquired infection, the risk of multidrug resistant is higher. So regarding microbiology, as occurs with candidemia, candida albicans is the most common infecting organism, more than 50% of the cases. Candida glabrata ranks second, even though in many hospitals we're seeing the incidence of infections due to candida glabrata are raising. Then candida tropicalis, candida parapsilosis, and other non-albicans candida species uh, can uh, be associated with intra-abdominal infection. In a small percentage, we have infection with two or more candida species at the same time. 
So what are the clinical manifestations of intra-abdominal candidiasis? Fever and abdominal pain, which can be associated with guarding or rebound um, tenderness, so peritoneal signs, nausea or vomiting. There can be uh, discharge from drains that are, have been placed, and whenever there is purulence, we should be thinking about infection. In terms of laboratory abnormalities, leukocytosis with left shift, several electrolyte abnormalities, acidosis, and traced inflammatory uh, markers. I have to mention that the clinical presentation is similar to what we are seeing with bacterial peritonitis. And as stated earlier, bacterial co-infection is quite common. So we have to base our diagnosis on microbiology, information that we get by obtaining fluid from uh, the intra-abdominal cavity. So you can have direct microscopy from intra-abdominal specimens that are obtained at the time of the surgery. And then we can use culture to establish the diagnosis, peritoneal or abscess fluid. In only a small percentage of cases of intra-abdominal infection, uh, can we, we can isolate the organism from the bloodstream. Drainage can be, um, we'll stop there, <laughs> okay, we'll correct that. There are uh, draining catheters in place uh, and it's easy to obtain fluid from those catheters. However, in a setting like that, we will recover organisms that are colonizing the drain and not necessarily causing infection. So unless the drain is placed recently within the last 24 hours, getting a culture from the drain is not helpful in diagnosing intra-abdominal infection. We also have uh, modern non-culture-based diagnostics such as the serum beta diglucan or candida PCR. And these markers have been studied in uh, the setting of uh, candida bloodstream infections. Um, we don't know much yet about those in the setting of intra-abdominal candidiasis. So how are we going to treat a patient with intra-abdominal infection? Source control is key. So we need to drain the abscesses or other collections within the abdomen or repair any anatomical defect that will lead to recurrent infection. The use of antifungals has been a contro controversial issue, but the recent studies have shown that patients who had received antifungal treatment had a better outcome in terms of mortality. So in general, echinocandin such as caspofungin, mycofungin, or anidulofungin are the agents of choice. We can use fluconazole alternatively if the patient is not critically ill, if they have not been exposed to azole treatment before, and thus we are not expecting uh, azole resistance. Prophylax of the disease in the setting of surgery where there is breach of the upper gastrointestinal tract, such as a gastric um, ulcer perforation. We can use fluconazole to prevent infection. So, and again here, um, source control is key in the treatment of this disease. And this can be achieved by um, percutaneous drainage, which can be done under CT guidance or ultrasound guidance. And in certain cases, um, transgastric aspiration and drainage is recommended. And then surgical procedures, laparotomy, to repair any anatomical defect and obviously to drain any uh, infected collections. Prognosis of the disease, early source control and antifungal treatment have been associated with improved outcomes. The mortality is quite high. In recent studies with the modern surgical techniques and support in the intensive care unit, mortality is as high as 30%, even higher in those uh, patients who have been admitted to the ICU. In this figure here, you can see 
that the mortality is higher with peritonitis when there is diffuse infection, whereas uh, mortality is lower in the setting of an abscess where the infection is more localized and easier to manage. Predictors of mortality, septic shock, high Apache score, upper GI tract source, nosocomial infection with multidrug resistant organisms, and inadequate source control are associated with higher mortality. On the other hand, if there is an abscess present that can be easy, easier managed, and whenever antifungal treatment is given, the outcomes are better. So as a summary, intra-abdominal candidiasis is a common and potentially fatal entity and is as common as candida bloodstream infections. Early source control and antifungal treatment are associated with improved outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you.